I got to interview Asar Thompson today after an event that he and the Detroit Pistons hosted. I'll play the interview for you guys, and we'll break down everything he had to say in the interview in today's episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. You are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. Per usual, I am your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on. That's another great way to support the podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest, most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Today I got to interview Asar Thompson after an event that he and the Detroit Pistons were hosting. It was a nutritional cooking demonstration. He got to go and uh uh, it was Asar Thompson and the team's uh, dietitian. They were in front of uh, a few students from Henry Ford's Health Generation with Promise Youth Wellness Program um, with the opportunity to teach them how to eat better, nutritional uh, advice and, and lessons, et cetera, et cetera. It was a cool event, and, and some of the food looked really good. I'm not going to lie to you. So really good event hosted, a cool event co- hosted by the Pistons and, and Asar Thompson. Um, but after this event, I was allowed to interview Asar Thompson for about five minutes, between four or five minutes, and ask him a few questions um, that I thought were incredibly interesting. I, I I asked him in detail because it wasn't just some like basic questions I was answering. I asking him, I should say, I wasn't trying to get like I wasn't trying to waste this time or anything. It actually was insightful stuff. I wanted to know. I wanted to hear from him because when he talks basketball, I I really like hearing Asar talk about basketball when he's not asked to just give bland answers. When he's allowed to talk about the X's and O's and things he actually cares about, he opens up. So. I thought he was an incredible uh, interview. I, I I liked hearing what he had to say. Um, so we're going to play it for you guys here. And then I'll come back afterwards. We'll break down everything he said for the rest of the episode. We'll talk about Asar's jump shot. We'll talk about his playmaking reps. We'll talk about all that. But you're going to go ahead and play the interview, and I'll be back right after that. So pre-draft, the business had the fifth overall pick, and I had to go through a lot of pre-draft process, and I was so very early that Asar Thompson should be the pick. And a lot of stuff with your athleticism, obviously, your defense – but really, really sold me was your long-term shooting development. A lot of, at the end of the OT season, you had a lot of off the dribble, self-created three-point looks. After this last game against the Cavs, you spoke about your confidence with the three-point shot. We even saw you. I thought take I think your first self-created threes of the season, aside step three. Is that something that you believe is still in your that you're you're working on every day, and is something that you see in your future the self-created looks that you were getting at OT? I know you talked about your confidence raising yeah. that you know, changing some of the things with your three-point shots. Is that something you see in your long-term development still? Yeah, a thousand percent. You know, I, I feel like I, I work on it every day. Uh, you know, I would just keep getting better and better. And, you know, I don't think there's a limit. And I feel like if I keep working, I can just get to any point I want to get to. So I, I'm, I'm not putting it past me. I think I, I you know, I'm going to get to the point where I'm confident shooting those and, Shooting the game and make them. Right. All right. And also, in this, one of the things you did a lot of at OTE uh, was a lot of ball handling. You created a lot for your brother. You created a lot for other players on the team as well. This season, you're a very versatile offensive player. They've used you in the short roll. They've used you on the number spot. They've used you attacking the tag on the weak side um, when you're in the weak side corner. Something that we saw a lot of in the OTE season, like I said, and in summer league was you leading the break and transition, finding guys using your anticipation, your eye manipulation to find open guys. Uh, is that something that you see that you'll start to do more of as the Pistons season goes on and going into the future as well? We've seen you pick up a little bit with it. Uh, they started to use it a little more, like I said, in the pick and roll. Yeah. Um, you still think that that's something that you can bring to the team, something that you see in your future when it comes to secondary playmaking for the team along with Cade and Ivy? seems like you guys had a lot of playmaking in that unit, something you talked about draft night as well. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, uh, I feel, you know, I can make plays with the ball. I can make uh, passes. I, I feel like I process the reads and what's going on uh, pretty well. And, you know, just – just going out there and doing it sometimes, you know, even sometimes they'll come up to me like, hey, T, you take it, and I'm like, all right, I got it, <laughs> got it. But just doing that more and just, uh, yeah, just just 
going and doing it. I feel like it's up to this. I feel like coaches trust me, players trust me, I trust myself. It's just I'm doing it. Right, and one of, the, one of the other things about your game that I think st sticks out a lot is your processing like you talked about just now. After the Cavs game, you spoke about when you knowing that your defender was tagging on the weak side and that you needed to be able to hit some corner threes. Another thing that you do a lot of is eating up that space and finding other ways to create buckets for your team or create open gaps for the other team. Is that something that you have always just had or something that you picked up on as you played more? And just what are some ways that you use, not just hitting the corner threes, but ways you attack that a defender tagging off you and you, how you process those things at a high level? I would say just, it's on my bones. I feel like I had, I feel like I, I learned it from playing with my twin, you know. My whole life, it's like kind of like, like something I had that not necessarily a lot of people had, but some people can develop it. I feel like it's, I don't think I ever just necessarily played for just myself. Like I always knew where somebody else was on the court. It's kind of really hard to explain, but I always just feel like I kind of know where someone would be or, sh or should be, I felt like they should be. So just when I get it attacking, get the paint, I know where my players are. I have a guy in the corner and just and just uh, make a read. So hopefully something comes up on the right. baseline and yeah, stuff like that. Just always having someone who, who knows the same thing. And I'm gonna get that alley uh, and get a weak side dunk on somebody. Yeah, you know? exactly. So I just want to say this. <laughs> First, <laughs> watching it back, I laugh because the last comment I made, I tried to land that joke and I did not land it. <laughs> I did not land it well at all. I was trying to make a joke about how he's such a freak athlete that a lot of times it's as easy as just eating up that space and throwing a lob and him just catching it over someone and dunking it. Um, but I did not land that joke very well. He he got it. He laughed. But watching it back, I'm like, oh my God, man, you could have landed that, landed that a lot better. Um, but... I, I wanted to play the interview, obviously, to start off. We'll move into talking about his jump shot, his answer about his jump shot. I mean, then we'll talk about some of the playmaking reps, and I'll bring some stats, whatever. Um, but one of my main takeaway from talking with Asar is, one, I, I think he's an incredible basketball mind. Anytime I've gotten the chance to ask him a question at the games or listen to him answer questions, if you ask him a question about basketball, he will give you a detailed answer. I love that about certain players. Some players, you know, when they have to answer media you know, they just want to get it over with and they give you like bland answers. And a lot of times it's because of the questions you're asking those said players. That's something that I was taught um, when I was first credentialed in, in 2018-19 by, by a few people um, that let me know that like, hey, if you're going to ask questions, you know, ask questions that will get good answers. Ask questions that let the player know that you actually care about like what's happening on the court, that you're actually analyzing what's happening on the court. Don't ask a bland answer. Give them easy answers so where they don't really have to care. Because that's when players will start to open up. They'll they'll want to answer. I I start start to open up in that interview, and as I've watched them throughout the year in the in the games I've watched, or and the pressers I've watched, if you ask him basketball questions, he's going to give you some good answers. I thought he gave some good answers there as well. Um, the other thing that I, I want to say about Sar before we get into any of this is that I I believe in this dude becoming like a legit star for the Detroit Pistons. I think his work ethic is through the roof. And the main thing, remember, this was something that I talked about uh, coming out of OTE before the Pistons even drafted him. I, I feel like self-awareness is such a huge thing in the NBA. I've talked to some NBA trainers. I've talked to some people who have trained NBA players. Like self-awareness and knowing where your weaknesses are, knowing what you have to do to be an excellent player and all of that is is one of the bigger hurdles that some NBA players go through. And Asar Thompson is just very self-aware. He knows what he struggles at. He knows what he has to do to be elite in the NBA. He knows what the NBA is. He's very knowledgeable about what the state of the NBA is in 2024, and he wants to get there. So I think he's going to get there. I think he's going to be an absolute star. I was I was happy I got to interview him. I hope I get to have him on the on the podcast in the future, maybe in the offseason. That would be great. Um, they did ha he did have limited time. I didn't get to ask him all the questions I wanted to ask. Um, I did try my best to fit everything that I was trying to ask him with some detail in the limited time I had. Um, but if I ever get to talk to him in the future, if I ever get to have him on the podcast, we'll go even more in depth with it. Um, and I think it will be a lot of fun. So when we come back, though, um, I want to talk about his answer and when it comes to shooting and whether I still believe in his shooting. Because remember, before the draft, I, I, that was one of my biggest selling points. Like I told him is that I believed in his long term shooting development. 
Do I still believe in that? We'll talk about that when we come back. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home that winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle, level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you'll get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guarantee fit, only available to U.S. customers at ebaymotors.com. So I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. Free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. So let's rewind a little bit all the way back to draft time. And at that draft time, we had Cam Whitmore. You had Asar Thompson. You had... Um, Taylor Hendricks, you had Jairus Walker. There's all kinds of people, uh, all kinds of prospects that the Pistons were considering. And a lot of different fans wanted them to draft. And very early on in that process, I identified Asar Thompson. And I, by draft now, I was, I'd say even way before draft now, I was completely sold on Asar Thompson being the pick. So much so that I picked him in the Locked On NBA mock draft and got made fun of by our Locked On draft analysts for drafting Asar Thompson. They ended up picking Asar Thompson, though, so maybe I know a little something. but. I picked Asar at that point because, like I told him in the interview, because of his athleticism, combined with his defense, combined with the playmaking ability, his processing. But the thing that really swung it for me is I started to believe in his long-term shooting development. And at the end, because of, especially at the end of his OTE season, first of all, in OTE, they shot from the NBA distance, which was a big thing for me. Um, they shot from the NBA distance, and from the, at the end of his OTE season, all the way into the playoffs, he shot really well, and a lot of his threes where he was shooting really well were not catch-and-shoot threes. A lot of it was self-created threes. A lot of it was step-back threes. A lot of it was uh, sidestep threes that he was hitting in that time frame. So the fact that he was hitting, if he was just hitting open catch-and-shoot threes, I probably wouldn't have felt as strongly about his long-term shooting development. But the fact that he was hitting self-created threes, tougher looks from the NBA distance, had me believing that, he could be a shooter in the in the future. That he could be uh, uh, someone who spaces the floor somewhat in the future. Now, if you fast forward to his rookie season, I mean, being honest, obviously that has not been the case at all. He has not shot the ball very well from deep at all. Him and his brother both are some of the worst three-point shooters in the league, just by the numbers. He's shooting 18% from deep. He's only taking 1.8 attempts a game, um, shooting, again, 18.6%. Um, and something that I think has been done a major disservice to him and something we'll talk about later on, by far his most used play type are spot-up opportunities. He has 190 possessions in spot-ups uh, or on spot-up opportunities. The next closest one is transition uh, opportunities where or transition possessions at 133 possessions. There's nearly 70 or 57, 60 possessions more are spot up opportunities where he's just not, he's not a good spot up shooter. So the fact that he has so many reps at that is, I think is is a major disservice to him, but nonetheless, the question is, do I believe in his long-term shooting development still? And I would say, I would say I'm lower than when I was pre-draft because I expected him to shoot a little better than he did. I didn't expect him to be a good three point shooter his first year. But I thought he'd hover around like 27, 28%. I thought that's where he would be. Being at 18% is a, a, a bit concerning for me um, that he, he had struggled that badly in some of his misses, um, being as bad as misses as, as they were. That is a little bit of a concern for me. However, his, the, the, off the, the off the dribble shot making is still there. You see it with his mid-range game and his touch on mid-range shots, which is something we brought up in the pre-draft uh, stuff as well. His touch on mid-range shots is there. 
and he has self create. He's able to hit fadeaway, self created looks from the mid range area. I I believe if you're if you have that touch from mid range, and you have the ability to create looks like that in the mid range, that can extend to beyond the three point line. And I guess I should point out as well that right around where I wanted him to shoot his rookie season, which is like 27, 28%. That's where he's shooting since the all-star break, where he's felt more confident. He's talked about how confident he's felt in his three point shot. He's shooting 27.6% on 3.2 attempts a game. Now, again, that's not good. That Like 27% is not good, but that's where I, if he had shot 27% for this whole season, I would have said, yeah, that's right around where I projected him to be. He's right on course with where I, you know, I'm projecting him to go. So, I think you're starting to see him become more confident. He's hitting more corner threes. His form looks more natural, I'd say, even though I do think his form really does need some work. Um, he has this, again, I've talked about this before in the podcast, where uh, th- there's some people I've hooped with all my life. And I-, I-, I was one of these players when I was really trying to become a better shooter after high school. I started training in college. Off the dribble, you are able to get like a better rhythm going of energy from your legs to your to your arms, and you just get more like on balance off dribble shots. I don't know how to explain it. And when it comes to standstill shots, you just don't have that same rhythm. I think that's the case. That it, 100% is the case of Sars going through right now. When he shoots shots off the dribble, he looks way more confident and way more just fluid. And it looks he has so much more touch on his shot off the dribble. I think he just needs to rework his catch and shoot, his, his standstill jump shot. I think a lot of it has to do with his footwork um, on those catch and shoot jump shots. Um, but I guess to answer the question, do I believe in his long-term jump shot? Do I still believe in his long-term development in that? Yes, I'm not completely off of that. I, I understand that he did not have a great year this year shooting the ball at what I expected him to be. As I said earlier, his work ethic is through the roof. And he is fully aware. He is not like one of these players – who, you know, thinks, you know, I don't need to be able to shoot threes. I'm good at other stuff. Why do I need to shoot threes? No, Asar is aware that he has to develop his three ball. Like, he's very aware of that. And he's work, He's going to work extremely hard on that. His work ethics through the roof. So, I believe that he's going to get there. The off-the-dribble stuff in the mid-range encourages me. His touch in the mid-range encourages me. How he's shooting since all-star break is encouraging to me. And the fact that he felt confident enough, I really would like to see him. To be honest, I'm not going to lie to you. If he took some self-created looks, I honestly wouldn't be too mad at it. I like the fact that you saw it come out in the Cavs game. That's something, again, it's something he did a lot of at the end of the OTE season. If you haven't watched, go watch it. He did a, he created a lot of his own three-point looks from the NBA line, off the dribble, fading, sidesteps at OTE in the playoffs and at the end of their season. I just feel like he's more comfortable off the dribble. So I wouldn't be too mad at seeing him try to take a few uh, self-created looks from deep. So. I still believe in his jump shot long-term. It's going to be a work in progress. He's not like he's going to be a good shooter next year or the year after. I think it's something that he's going to be building towards becoming a a better shooter. But I I still believe in it. Yeah, I I still think he can get there. And if he does get there, I I don't know what his ceiling is. Like, if if Asar adds a jump shot, I, I don't know what his ceiling would be. Like, is there a ceiling? Like, I think his ball handling has to improve, which is something we'll talk about in the third segment coming up. Uh, but if his jump shot got to a respectable level, I just don't know where, like, how, like, how do you stop him? He's one of the, he might be the most athletic player in the M- NBA, him and his brother. He ha- he is a tremendous passer. He sees the game very well, processes the game at the very high level. If he can also shoot the three, it opens up more drives to the rim and sprays the floor out. Like, I just don't know what would happen. Like, I don't know how great he could be. And that's why the Pistons drafted him. They bet on that, and I don't blame him. So even after him struggling this year, like I said, I I believe in it, and I'd like to see him get even more looks up. Um, And, again, if he took some self-created threes, I wouldn't wouldn't mind it at all. So um, let me know what you guys think. Do you guys believe in Asar Thompson's long-term shooting development? Let me know in the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. When we come back, should Asar Thompson be getting more playmaking reps at the end of the season moving forward into the Pistons' future? We'll talk about that when we come back. Price Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. They are the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six stat player projections and watch the winnings roll in. It's demon time on Price Picks. You can now win up to 100 times 
your money with as little as four correct picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000. Demons and Goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play at prize picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins get you different payouts. You can win now up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. And one of the other things I absolutely love about prize picks is they have an injury insurance policy. If one of your players, let's say in an NBA or NFL, get hurt in the first half, your player is automatically rebooted if he does not return in the second half. And I know if you're involved in daily fantasy sports, heck, any fantasy sports, you know that that ruins everything for you a lot. And PrizePix is the only place out there that gives you a reboot or something like that. I absolutely love it. So go to PrizePix.com slash locked in NBA and use code locked in NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, PrizePix.com slash locked in NBA and use code locked in NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood dot com slash boost subscription fees apply and now for some legal info claim as of quarter one 2024 validated by radius global market research investing involves risk including loss limitations apply to iras and 401ks three percent match requires robin hood go for one year from the date of the first three percent match must keep robin hood ira for five years the three percent matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions robin hood ira available to u.s customers in good standing robin hood financial llc member sipc is a registered broker dealer get started with robin hood so i want to thank you guys for making locked on pistons your first listen of every single day we're free and available on all your podcast platforms if you haven't already head to the youtube channel at locked on pistons Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. Should Asar Thompson be getting more playmaking reps? Well, I think the easy short answer is 100% yes. And the first place I'm going to go with is why I mentioned you guys earlier. The fact that his the most used play type he has is spot-up possessions, I think it's crazy. That, that can't be happening. With someone who's not as... Uh, let's just keep it blank, a, a good shooter in Asar Thompson, that should not be his most used play type. That's the first thing. Secondly, going all the way back, again, let's rewind the clock, going all the way back to OTE, his playmaking was what really sold me on him as a player. That was part of it. His ability to create for others, his ability to process defenses, his ability to make the right reads and make anticipation reads. There was that play. If you guys remember... We're going all the way back really here. All the way back in summer league, he had a play in transition that we broke down on the podcast where he had a guy running up the left wing in the left corner with one defender choosing between them. And instead of immediately throwing up to the wing guy, he looked at the wing, made the defender start to move towards the wing guy, kept his eyes on the wing guy, and then threw like a no-look pass to the guy cutting back door and created that completely with his eye manipulation and anticipation as a passer. So he has that ability. It's what made him such an intriguing prospect and I don't think the Pistons have really utilized it to its utmost ability. I, like I told him in the interview, he is an incredibly versatile offensive player. Like, I know he can't shoot right now, but that doesn't take away his versatility as an offensive player. He can be used in the screen and roll game. He can be used as a pick and roll ball handler. He can be used as a cutter. He can be used as a screener. Like, there's all kinds of different ways. As, as a, you, you can use them, like we mentioned uh, in the interview. He can cut down along baseline in the weak side corner, and you can throw a lob up to him and dunk on somebody like there's different ways you can use him in your offense because of his unique skill sets. And yes, that it doesn't include shooting, but that shouldn't limit what you can use him as. Um, And I know this is a very small sample size, which is, I think unfair. He should have more samples, um, more possessions doing this. Um, But according to synergy, he only has 29 possessions as a pick and roll ball handler in those 29 possessions. He's in the 85th percentile, classified as excellent by Synergy. That's a he's in his limited reps, he's been fantastic in the pick and roll. 
another type of situation where he has the ball in his hands flowing downhill, coming off handoffs, coming off DHOs. He also has 29 possessions doing that. And he's in the 90th percentile doing that. Again, classified as excellent by synergy. That's when he's at his best. When he's at uses the pick and roll man, he's in the 58th percentile. They have it classified as good. On cuts, 44th percentile. He's around an average cutter. But now when you start putting him in spot up, he's in the 13th percentile. He's one of the worst in the league. No duh. So, I yes, I do think Asar Thompson should be used as a pick and roll ball handler. He should be used a little bit more as a secondary playmaker as the season goes on. Remember, I mentioned this in his interview with him. Asar Thompson went out of his way on draft night to mention that he thought the NBA was going towards a league that was that you have to have multiple playmakers in your lineup. And remember, going up to the draft, that was my argument for it. If you look across the league, a, a lot of the great teams have multiple guys that can attack a gap, kick out, make the right decisions, and keep the ball going. That was supposed to be what was great about the Pistons team, and the .5-second offense was supposed to help that. Now, like that's a whole different discussion there about whether the .5-second offense has been utilized. But Asar should have the ball in his hands a little bit more. Whether it's with the second unit, whether you get it to him in inverted pick and roll, you let him and Cade run pick and roll. Heck, maybe you let Asar have the ball and have Cade set the screen for him and have Cade flare out to the three-point line. There's two options that the defense can do with that. Either defense switches and Asar gets a smaller guy on him, or the defense doesn't switch, they get lost, Cade flares out, and then Cade gets an open three. Either way, I think Asar's guaranteed to get a paint touch, and if he gets a paint touch, Usually good things happen. Either he gets fouled, he's finishing, or he's finding an open guy somewhere. So, like, there's so many different ways you can utilize him with the ball in his hands that, that I don't understand why it's been so little used, even off the bench, I, I especially in transition. That's where it really – that's where it really confuses me, that he hasn't had the ball as much, like, like leading the fast break. And when he does lead the fast break, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, it's been a little bit of a complaint of mine. When he gets the ball in transition, it's not like he's – it feels like he's almost immediately looking to give it up. Like he's been instructed to – Cade needs to run the uh, run the transition attempts. Like Ivy needs to run the fast break. Get the ball out your hands and just run the wings. Because it's never – he doesn't get the ball and just take it himself and, and think about going coast to coast or trying to create something for somebody. He gets it. He takes a few dribbles. He's immediately looking for somebody. I, I think that's re- that's a really big mistake. You're, we saw a lot of it in summer league. That's when he was at his best creating for people. I, I, and you saw it a lot in OTE too. I feel like you're just limiting what he can bring to your offense and what he brings to the to the team by not having him do that stuff. So, and I know he talked about how he believes he can do that, how he has high processing. Again, yeah, I, that's why I was so high on him as a prospect. And I, I guess we'll wrap it up here. This is probably the, my favorite thing. I probably should have mentioned this earlier. I'm not going to lie. My, my favorite thing about what he said in this interview was, one that he like that he's a high processor that he thinks he processes things very quickly and reads defenses and knows where everyone's supposed to be and is going to be at. Um, and then he also mentioned that he never has considered himself a player that plays for himself. Like he's not just he basically was saying he's not a selfish player. And remember going all the way back to the pre-draft. A lot of the concern about him coming out over OTE was that OTE is a, a fake league. Like he can just go over there and dominate. And my biggest counter to that was that if he was just over there scoring 30 points a game on weaker competition and just dominating that way, like, okay, sure. Like, then I maybe you could have an argument. But Asar, Asar played the right way. He was not out there just looking to dominate the competition and score a lot of points. That's not what he was looking to do. He was looking to play the right way, make the right reads, and develop his own game for the NBA. That's what he was He played the right way. Could Asar went out there and, and shot 30 times and averaged like 40 points? Like, sure, maybe. Sure, I, if he wanted to do it, maybe he could have. But he knows that's not the right way to play basketball. And he's trying to develop that part of his game. And that's why I that's why I'm so high on this kid. That's why I'm so high on him as a prospect and as a future NBA player. His IQ, his work ethic, and his self-awareness, I, I think it's just off the charts. So yes, I think he should continue to get playmaking reps. It clearly is something he believes he can do. And he has he says he has teammates sometimes tell him, hey, go get the ball and, and go do your thing. Go create for somebody. And he has to be like, okay, I'll go get it. Like, it should be something that's already in the offense, I feel like. You should be calling plays that involve getting a Sarah Thompson the ball going downhill. Because in the limited samples you have, again, it's small samples, but in that sample has been, I, I would say it's deserving of more looks. If it hadn't went well, fair enough, but it's went extremely well, so continue to give you some more looks. So, um, 
I, I mean, that's really all I got with it, man. I, I really like talking with the SAR. I think he's incredibly smart. And I think that's going to play great for him down the line. I hope to have him on the podcast in the off season. We'll see about that. Um, I think it would be really dope to sit down and break down some plays and talk about his game and break down stuff. I, he's, he is a basketball junkie. I think that's what I love. I think that's what makes me love him the most is that he's a basketball junkie. He like he basketball is his life. He loves basketball. The X's and O's, the the deep you know, you know deep breakdowns of like that's what he loves. He loves NBA. He loves basketball. And I, I I will bet on guys like that all the time. Guys who love the game and want to be better. That those are the type of guys I'll bet on. So um, let me know what you guys think about what he said in the interview and what we talked about here in today's episode in the comment section down below or over on uh, on Twitter at Cuckoo Hill. That's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you guys for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. Hit that subscribe button to the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Stay safe out there. Until next time, peace out.